drones evoke images of warfare, of death and destruction. Drones have been used widely throughout the warfare around our world, in Afghanistan, in Pakistan, and even in the Yemen. However, I choose to look at the other side of drones and look at drones for good and not drones for warfare. So, I keep getting asked this, but how in the world did I get into drones? I've dedicated my life to conservation and protected area management. And I've worked at the front end of conservation and I've worked in government organizations basing my life on conservation work. I now work at AUT, or Auckland University of Technology, where I am mentoring and hopefully inspiring the next generation of conservationists. <laughs> I saw in drones a tool that would help me with my conservation work. I actually am scared of small airplanes, but with my supervisor, I used to fly in small airplanes counting these really cool creatures called dugongs and other whales and other wildlife on the east coast of Australia. It was scary. So I ask you to picture yourself flying in a small aircraft 400 feet above the ocean at high speed with little room for air. It's really noisy. The plane is vibrating. I had to pee in a bucket. It was downright scary. I knew there had to be a better way. So I contacted the New Zealand Defence Force five years ago, and they put me in touch with a commercial drone developer who was making airframes for their autopilot system. And to me, that was the beginning of a wonderful partnership, a partnership with industry, with their customised airframes that they built for extreme environments, and with our team of geospatial scientists at AUT, we could go anywhere, and we have been to some of the remotest locations on the planet. This year, we've been to Antarctica. It was such an awe-inspiring experience for me and for the whole team to work in this pristine environment. As a scientist, what an amazing experience to work in one of the last wilderness areas on this planet an area that I believe is largely unimpacted by humans. But this could change. This could change if we allow tourism or other use to escalate without careful management and protection measures. So we went to Antarctica, and one of the questions we asked was, can we map human impacts on vulnerable habitats such as this using our drones? We were a team of modern-day explorers armed with drones and really expensive cameras and other robotic equipment. And we spent this last summer in Antarctica mapping in high resolution some of the most amazing protected areas in the Ross Sea region. One of the places we surveyed was Cape Evans. Now, many of you might know this, but Cape Evans is actually the site where Captain Robert Falcon Scott built his base for the 1910 to 1913 expedition. This is an amazing building. And around that area, you can still see some of the debris that they left behind, even bones from the mutton that they ate. So it really is quite a special area, and it's been beautifully restored by the New Zealand Antarctic Heritage Trust. It felt as if Scott had just left, and we were waiting for him to come back. But many of you will realize that Scott never came back to this hut. He reached the South Pole and he died on his journey coming back. So what did we do? We were there to actually map and collect baseline information about this really special area. So it's special from historic reasons and it's also special because of the fragile ecosystem surrounding the hut. We did this with our drones. But previously, this sort of survey work would have been done by foot. You would have had teams of surveyors going out. It would have taken months, if not years, to map and survey the entire area. The problem with this is that every time you step on that fragile environment, you leave a footprint. And that footprint can last for hundreds of years. So we wanted to avoid doing that. So we took our drones, and this is footage from one of the drones taking off, 
And we took two days to map the entire area. And not only did we map the protected area, we mapped 150 hectares surrounding it. We mapped in one centimeter resolution for all you camera nerds out there, but actually some of it was less than a centimeter. And our human footprint was minimal because we launched our planes from outside the protected area and were able to retrieve them from back outside the area. We collected thousands of images in high resolution, and this is showing you the images that we then stitched together, and we created a 3D mosaic of this place. We're flying through that mosaic now, but from this mosaic, we can actually map biodiversity. We can look at all these special areas. We can even map the walking trails that humans have walked on through this landscape. We were able to also map and discover all these trails left from seals that came up from the shore. We're able to generate these virtual reality interactive displays, such as the one that you're watching right now. And I invite you to come to our display downstairs where you too can visit Scott's hut and walk around in the landscape with your virtual reality goggles. It really was an amazing experience. From a conservation perspective, this work that we did will allow policymakers to make better informed decisions about the future management of this area. This new technology has completely changed the way I do my science. It has provided me and my team with new opportunities that none of us ever imagined were possible. We've just returned last week from Namibia, where we were invited to map threatened desert ecosystems. It was a lot hotter there. And we've also going to Tonga, where we're working with drones to look at the behavior of humpback whales in relation to tourism vessels. We were invited by the Queensland government to go to Australia and to map some of the most threatened turtle habitats on the Great Barrier Reef. Those habitats also have lots of seabirds, so we were able to map those as well and their nesting sites. One of the things from that work that we're developing with the Queensland government is best practice or policies on how to fly these drones around wildlife. How do we do it safely and ethically and protect the animals that we're trying to survey? Finally, I work with Indigenous Australians, and I'm working with them to map some of their most sacred sites these sites are very precious, and what we want to do is to empower them to make management plans so that they can safeguard those locations for future generations. I believe that the use of drones is an absolute game changer for science. And how we use these drones is only limited by our human imagination. Thank you.